Well, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you this afternoon on this cold January day. And um, I'm going to talk, um, it's going to be a little bit eclectic because I'm going to jump around into a, a few different areas that are connected with the ethics of scientific writing, which uh, was, a, I think it was a title that you sent to me at some point. But um, one of my interests is, is the responsible conduct of research. And so I have done different training sessions in, in, in different aspects. In, in different formats. And this presentation covers um, some of the issues with responsible conduct of research with respect to writing, but we'll touch on a few other areas as well. And these are things that I think will be reinforced to you throughout this two-day period. So um, we're going to try, given the technical issues setting up here, we're going to do an experiment and see if the next technical thing works, because I want to use a, a software that's called Poll Everywhere. And so I'm gonna ask you a question and you can either respond by uh, sending a text and, and the address will go up in, in a few minutes about where you should text and then you can put your answers in with your smartphones. Or if you have a laptop, you, there will be a, a URL that you can log into from the laptop. So the first topic that we're gonna address is research integrity. And then I'm going to talk a bit about plagiarism and a bit about data management and presentation. I'm not going to teach you how to manage your data or, and you've just had a lecture about how to make good presentations, but I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the pitfalls you can run into with those issues. So here's our first question, and it's a multiple choice. And so you can respond either by logging into this URL or you can text that number and then you join MLinder. And it doesn't matter if you put it all caps. And then the question is, what is integrity? And there are four choices here. And if things work well, I'll see that you're starting to respond down here. <coughs> And the key for me always is not to show the results beforehand because then I find people changing their minds and the graph goes crazy. So um, we should be activated. Oh, I can see the numbers going up here. Okay, so last few seconds here. Can you put in an answer at this point if you want to participate? Well, now I'm getting a sense of how many people are in the room. More than I estimated. Oh, somebody changed their mind. <laughs> hmm. All right, let's take a look and see where we are. So we'll lock the results and we'll show results. And so we have a somewhat of a split decision, but the majority has gone with all of the above. 28% uh, of you say adherence to a code of especially moral or artistic values, an unimpaired condition. There's a few of you who have suggested that. And we didn't have any votes as a sole definition as the quality or state of being complete or undivided. So um, given the split decision, um, if you go by the Merriam-Webster definition of what integrity is, all of the above is the correct answer. So if we go on here and look at what the Merriam-Webster says, and they give a synonym for each of these answers. So when you think about research integrity, 
this adherence to a code of especially moral or artistic values, that I think is, is what comes to mind to me in terms of, of, of what research integrity is, is that there are standards by which the research community um, operates by that we think that th these are important values in terms of being honest and trustworthy about our data and how we report it. So <clears throat> incorruptibility is uh, the synonym that the dictionary gives for this first uh, word. So when you're thinking about um, you're, you're processing a lot of data and you've got this hypothesis and the data is coming in and you see a subset of the data supports the hypothesis, but then some other experiments nullify it, if you're incorruptible, you will report, you will look at all of the data, you won't exclude data. So as an incorruptible scientist, we are going to be driven by what the data are, and then we'll make our best interpretation of them. So that's one definition. Unimpaired condition or soundness. And the way I relate this to research integrity is when I'm thinking about the fact that I want to make sure that when I design an experiment, it's well designed, that the experiment, that the data are collected and recorded properly, that they're stored properly, so that there's a soundness to the research, that it, I can feel that the quality of the research is good, and that um, accordingly, then I can trust the results. Now, the quality or state of being complete or undivided our completeness, that's truly a definition for integrity. It's a little bit harder to relate to it. So the way I think about this is if you have a piece of paper uh, and then you rip this piece of paper up into uh, a bunch of little pieces, the integrity of the piece of paper has been destroyed. So this, this is a slightly different use of the word completeness. But I think um, perhaps in terms of, of research, completeness is when you address a problem, you want to make sure that you're thinking about it from uh, as complete a point of view as you can. Again, not selecting data, not putting yourself down a, uh, a, a pathway that uh, you're putting blinders on to other important information that will help you interpret your results. Okay. So we all want to think that we have research integrity. I hope that all of you um, have research in, or, or have integrity. I certainly believe that all of you do. Um, and, but as scientists, we're human. And humans are fallible, impulsive, impressionable, subjective. We have our biases. And we also are pretty good, um, maybe not so perhaps so much with our research, but maybe in, in the context of our relationships or, or whatever that Maybe we deceive ourselves occasionally, or we can rationalize our, our actions. But we also want to think that as scientists, that we're honest and trustworthy, that we're systematic and exact. And what we want to make sure that we're, you know, that we want to strive for these qualities as we're uh, collecting data and ultimately going to publish it. Now, research integrity, and even the responsible conduct of research, um, we, we can fail at that. And when we fail at that, it's not always that we, because we're, you know, that we're uh, nefarious or doing anything really bad. So for example, you, your research integrity could be questioned if someone looks at your paper and looks at your data and interprets it in a different way. So, I would say that that has nothing to do, a different interpretation of the data doesn't have anything to do with your research integrity. It's just a different interpretation of the data. We're doing science, we're, ban we're going forward, we're figuring out things that nobody's ever figured out before. So I might look at a set of data and, and do a legitimate uh, uh, analysis that's uh, with all the integrity in the world, and somebody else with a different mindset can come in and look at that and interpret it in a different way. So this would not be something where we'd say that there was a lack of research integrity. The other thing that can happen is that we make mistakes. And so often honest mistakes are discovered in the literature. And the nice thing about science is that as we try to reproduce it, um, or others are looking at it, we can find out, we can find and correct those mistakes. So the goal of science is that ultimately that it's self-correcting. Then there are those of us who sometimes take shortcuts 
or get sloppy and um, are not as careful. And so there, now we're getting into an area where our integrity may be a little bit in question. And then there's the truly nefarious where we deliberately set out to deceive someone. So there can, unfortunately, there are cases of deliberate deception in science as well. So in terms of how the community, research community defines research misconduct, the definition that, that I go by, and I would say that, um, that is set by the Department of Health and Human Services, which is where the National Institutes of Health are, they um, define research misconduct quite simply with, by these three terms. The first is fabrication, the second is falsification, and the third is plagiarism. So these are the contexts by which you can evaluate what we would say uh, true research misconduct. So let's take these one at a time. So fabrication is the, to me, is the, is the truly nefarious where you actually make up the data or the results um, and you record, record them or report them. Now, if you make up data and record them and put them in a laboratory notebook, made up data, that's still research misconduct. Whether it goes out the door to a publisher or not, you still do not ever make up data. Um, so let me, I wanna tell you a little bit of story about a case of, of research misconduct that actually happened here at Cornell uh, back in 1981. So there was a graduate student who came in, actually came in mid-year into the uh, Department of Biochemistry here at the, at the time, it was the, I think the Department of Biochemistry. So he was actually admitted in January because he was thought to be this incredibly bright, very special student. And so he joined a laboratory and his job was to try to study the uh, function of this enzyme um, whose activity was altered in cancer. And so he began to do protein purification where he was trying to find out how this enzyme was regulated. And within six months, he had his first paper. He had the data for the first paper. And it was truly remarkable that an entering graduate student would be able to put a paper together this quickly. Um, and particularly with the biochemical kinds of experiments he was doing that are typically very time consuming and, and strenuous. And within 18 months, there were something like four or five more papers that were put together. So the, this was, he was considered like the whiz kid of all whiz kids. I mean, everybody was so impressed with what he had done. And I don't want to get, try to get into the science of all of it because we don't have enough time, but it's actually a pretty fascinating story um, in, in itself in that he, had identified a series of enzymes that were that that really helped resolve a major unresolved issue in cancer research that was going on at the time and it actually helped to tie together several disparate areas um, and it really was sort of this unifying principle and there's a big conference that was held annually at the cold spring harbor uh, laboratory and he was given like a 45 minutes time slot to the talk at this thing as a graduate student so this was this huge, big deal. But the problem is, of course, science has to be reproducible, and nobody could reproduce what he was doing. And it took a very long time to figure out, but he had actually, from the outset, designed a strategy to fake everybody out about this. So normally, when you, the way he was doing his biochemistry is that you were taking like cell extracts, and trying to purify a protein kinase, a pro this enzyme from a cell extract where you have thousands of proteins and you very carefully go through multiple steps to get this purified component. Well, he was just going to the Sigma catalog and ordering random, random proteins from the Sigma catalog. And then he could take radioactive iodine and he could label the protein with radioactive iodine. And then he could put those proteins onto a gel and then expose and, and do electrophoresis and so separate them on a gel and expose them to film. And so you get these nice bands on the gel. So if those of you who have friends in, in, in the life sciences, they're always looking at these, these gels and you see these labeled bands. So he had these beautiful, auto, these are called autoradiographs. They were beautiful autoradiographs. And it's a big one. How does he get this? Why can't I get this? And why isn't this working? 
And it really was um, Professor Volker Vogt, who's still in the, um, in the molecular biology and genetics department, was skeptical about this guy. And he was trying to figure out, and he was trying to reproduce some of the experiments himself. He was a new assistant professor. And so it turns out that the radioactivity that he said he was working with was P32, which is a beta particle emitter. But what was on the protein was gamma radiation with, from the I-125. And so it turns out you can distinguish those things by the fact that um, beta particles won't go through plexiglass and iodine will go through, radioactive iodine will go through a plexiglass shield. So when Dr. Vogt was sitting there with his plexiglass shield working with the P32 behind the shield and looking at his, and he got one of the, one of the gels from, the, from our nefarious graduate student, he noticed that the, the, the radioactive signal with the Geiger counter was still coming through the shield. And so he realized it couldn't be P32. It had to be a gamma emitter. And then ultimately then that they were able to go back and the guy finally admitted what he had done. So this is, you know, and so this was written up in the New York Times. It was a big scandal. It was a horrible thing for, for the professor, uh, the major professor. And so it's one of the best known scandals of fabrication of data. Now the guy is brilliant in terms of being able to pull this off and keep this going for as long as he did. But really, um, you know, there are people who are using it. It's kind of a shame that someone that, that was that brilliant used their, uh, used their skills for ill rather than for good. Because he probably could have figured out a lot of really important things. So that is what we call, that's, that's a true case, a true story of fabrication. Now, falsification is different in the sense that there you've got a bunch of data and then you start throwing out the data that doesn't fit with your hypothesis. So that's data selection or altering the records. Um, so it's the manipulating uh, the research materials, the equipment. So maybe you set the gain differently on the instrument that you're using so that you're going to screen out something that might be important. Um, that's falsification. And then finally, it's plagiarism. And that's misrepresenting another's work as one's own. So plagiarism is probably more, the, of these the most connected to where we are with respect to scientific writing. And so I want to spend a little time reviewing plagiarism. So what is it? Okay. So are our two guys here? Is, He's quite upset because this guy's plagiarized his sign. <laughs> but really, when it comes down to it, there are, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of words that are in the, in phrases that are, um, and commonly used. So not everything is plagiarism. But what is plagiarism is misrepresenting someone else's creative work. So in addition to their words or their methods or their pictures, there's a lot of things that you could plagiarize. The key here is that if you are using somebody else's method, we all stand on the shoulders of giants in terms of, of what's been done before us. But if, um, if Jason here you know, develops a method, and then I say, oh, that's a really great method for me to measure the activity of my enzyme, then if I sit down to write a paper and I use Jason's method to characterize the enzyme, I need to give Jason credit for that, right? So, um, I don't want to say that I I don't want to publish the paper where it looks like I developed this method. I'm adapting someone else's. So it's important that you give the appropriate priority. So I like to tell stories a little bit. So I'm going to tell you the story of John Walsh. So John Walsh was a war hero. Um, he'd been in the, uh, the Montana Army National Guard. He had fought in Iraq. He was um, wounded in Iraq and he'd won multiple. Uh, infantry badges and, and uh, was considered a real war hero. So he decided after he left the, uh, left the military that he wanted to become the U.S. Senator from Montana. And as it turned out, um, early in 2014, the uh, sitting Senator from Montana retired. And so he was appointed. So, and, and he was appointed. He's a Democrat. And then he was going to run for re-election, which would have been in, in November of 2014. 
well, you know, we all know about politics. We probably know a lot more about politics than we care about knowing about politics these days, but opposition research has been around for a long time. And so the Republican opposition research group went digging around into his background as they do with opposing candidates. And they found that his master of arts thesis from the War College, he'd been in a master's program for a year, was plagiarized. Now, given that this guy was running for US Senate from Montana, this again lands in the New York Times and um, ultimately uh, torpedoed his career as a senator. So um, I don't expect you to be able to read this, but one thing at the War College, apparently you can get a thesis with a 20 page master's thesis. So uh, <laughs> I thought that was sort of interesting. But essentially what they're showing here is um, they took they took it, they took the thesis, and they noticed that there were two types of plagiarism here. One was where they he had in pink, these are all the passages that he took without attribution. So if there's no attribution, if there's no citation, one makes the assumption that that's original work. So this is stealing somebody else's work or ideas. And then in yellow, this is where he had actually used their words. So he um, he had attributed the uh, the content to someone else. He put a footnote that says where the content came from, but he didn't bother to rewrite it, nor did he put it in quotation marks. So um, as you can see, short of the references, pretty much the whole thing had been plagiarized. So what did he do? He did plagiarism of words, where you want to use their exact or almost exact language without quotation marks. That's a no-no. And then the plagiarism ideas in that the six major conclusions were copied from another document without a citation, implying that the conclusions were original. And this is really, I mean, both of these things are egregious, but this second one, I think the, the idea that, you know, that he took somebody else's ideas and wrote them out and, and with, with the clear implication that they were his ideas, um, this is clearly plagiarism as well. So, <clears throat> we don't want to do that. Now, what happened to him is that uh, he, um, he not only ha ultimately had to, so actually his excuse was is that he was suffering from PTSD, but ultimately the, because of the extent, so, so here's where you get into the, uh, the you know, PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder. So he was highly stressed. So if he had, you know, perhaps if there were some modest plagiarism in this document, you could buy that, that under stress that perhaps he was careless and, and the, sort of the honest mistake. But the fact that the entire document was plagiarized, the War College said, no, 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 this is not, you know, we aren't, we aren't going to accept that as a valid excuse for this. And they took away his master's degree. He also had to withdraw from the Senate race and, and uh, uh, so that was the end of his political career. I think he sells real estate now from what I've read um, online. So one has to, um, you know, one, I like this, uh, Sid here is trying to take credit for Planck's constant. And uh, it's, I think it's kind of an interesting strategy, but perhaps not one that um, we should adopt. Okay, so I like this, um, this argument that's been said uh, that comes from Suzette Newberry in the Cornell Libraries. So the issue with plagiarism, it's, it's not just that you, you, you don't want to do it because you shouldn't do it, but if you write in a way that, um, and avoid using any kind of plagiarism, it really allows you to demonstrate, first of all, that you comprehend others' ideas. So, you know, often we have to t write about somebody else's work and, you know, they spent a lot of time writing it down the first time. And so it's pretty, you know, I had a student once who, who told me, it's like, well, they can say it so much better than I can, you know, why should I rewrite it? Well, um, the thing is, is that if you can rewrite it in your own words, you probably will have a much better understanding of it than perhaps just copying it. But you can't, if you do, if you do want to use their words, then just put it in quotation marks be honest about it and put the citation. It shows respect for other people, um, for other scholars. And the other, the most important, I think to me, the most important thing is, 
is then when you do write something original in your paper and you have your own conclusions, you, it's very clear that they're yours. Because if you've written all, all the background information without citations, then when they read the conclusions of your paper, it's like, well, is that theirs or is that somebody else's idea? So you want to be clear um, in terms of, of valuing, you know, you want to make clear that, that the original ideas are indeed yours. And if you avoid plagiarism and the other aspects of your manuscripts, that will help you. And here's our word integrity again. You want to uphold the integrity of your own ideas and you don't want to embarrass your, your mentor. You don't want to embarrass your peers, the institution, the funding agencies. These are all institutions that are relying on you to do the right thing, to have research integrity. Um, so the, believe me, Cornell was not happy when Mark Spector's fake research came out and was, pub, was written up in all of the major journals and was written in, and in the New York Times. I mean, those are that 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 diminishes the reputation of the university as well as the individual. Now, something that's a little bit more challenging to think about is this issue of self plagiarism. So, when is it okay to reuse your own work in your own words, and when isn't it? So, I'm a biochemist. I work on a process that's called protein fulmination which is the addition of fatty acids to cysteine residues in proteins through a reversible thioester linkage. And you will find those words in every paper I've written about palmitylation. So I reuse those. I don't put them into quotation marks. And in fact, you'll find those same words probably in all my competitors because it's a definition, okay? It's a definition of a process. And there's, you are not going to be able to think of a new way to define protein palmitylation every time you write a paper. So those, you know, so reusing uh, those, that kind of reuse of words is perfectly appropriate. On the other end of the spectrum, you have people, and I was on a publications committee for, uh, for the American Society of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, who would, you know, put three or four figures together and send them off to Journal A and publish it in Journal A and then take half of those figures and put them with some other figures and put them in Journal B and he would get credit for them having two separate publications. And so there was a lot of CV padding that was going on there. That's not acceptable. You cannot republish your work um, and, and, and argue that it's, it's original research. And again, this comes back to, it is okay to reuse your work if you use proper attribution or citation. So what do I mean by that? So here's the American Chemical Society policy regarding self-plagiarism. So you should engage in self-plagiarism, also known as duplicate publication, which is unacceptably close replication of the author's own previously published text or results without acknowledgement of the, of the source. Now they provide what they call a, a reasonable person standard. So if I publish a paper, two papers in the, in the biochemistry journal for ACS, and I have my definition of, of, of protein palmitylation in both of them, and somebody writes in to the publisher and says she's a plagiarist, the editor will look at that and say, if you reuse a sentence or two from an introduction of one paper in another paper, they are un very unlikely to find, call that self-plagiarism. However, if the first six paragraphs of your paper are verbatim in two different papers that are considered separate publications, primary publications, the editor is probably going to be less sympathetic, particularly if they're not, if they're not in, they don't want you to regurgitate other publications. They want original research. So if you quote verbatim from your previously published work, you want to put it in quotation marks. And Here's the key phrase. It's unacceptable for an author to depict his, her previously published results or methodology as new without acknowledging the source. So again, don't try to double publish your work and, and when you're calling it primary research. Now, where is what defines prior publication? Because you're all going, wait a minute, I'm writing a thesis. 
And if I publish it in my thesis, does that mean that I have to put the whole thing in quotation marks if I want to publish it in a journal? Does that? And that's so. So the clearly an abstract, a poster, a thesis or dis dissertation, a presentation. Those are all perfectly appropriate venues for you to present your thesis research, um, and that can then later be published without anyone accusing you of duplicate publication. And we now, you're going to, I, I think you, if you haven't already heard about it, you're going to be hearing about BioArchive and, and these other um, preprint servers, servers. And so this is another area where um, it's very, there's clear standards in terms of it's appropriate to go ahead and put papers preprints in, in these, um, uh, these archives. So this is the policy that I took from the Journal of Bio Biological Chemistry, which just happens to be a journal that I use. And if you go to the website of most journals, they will tell you, um, they will give your the policies for, um, uh, for what their standards are. Now, the other thing about plagiarism these days is it's really easy to find because everything's, you know, everything's digital. So uh, for those, you know, certainly <clears throat> the Turnitin software is something that um, once all of these research, undergraduate research papers turned up for purchase on the web, um, the professors quickly, there soon became a business where they could, um, where you could go to develop software and find out if some of this material had been was original or was copied from another source. But reputable publishers have a similar system called Crossref. So they could, when you submit a manuscript to a journal, if that journal deposits their, um, if they deposit their archive into this Crossref program, then your paper could be compared to that. And this is the kind of thing that if somebody accused you of plagiarism, reported to the publisher that it was plagiarism, then it would probably go through some kind of examination. Um, this might be a, a way that they would um, address this. Now, sometimes it gets a little tricky trying to decide about what is plagiarism and what isn't. And the Arts and Sciences website here has a quiz on plagiarism. And I can tell you the first time I took the quiz, I got one wrong. So I thought I, I, thought I knew a lot about plagiarism. But it's actually, it's actually kind of fun to take the quiz. Um, and I'm going to give you the slides. You'll get the slides so that you can find this link. But I, I think that's a useful tool. And there are a number of sources here that will help you um, address, uh, address this issue in terms of educating you further about plagiarism. So we've talked about research misconduct and told you one horror story about fabrication. We've talked about uh, plagiarism now. Um, this whole concept of research integrity um, really fits, really uh, it coincides with all aspects of our lives as scientists, as graduate students here, and how we, how we deal with the community. And, you know, there's all of the theoretical, you know, like I say, well, I'm, you know, I'm all holy, I'm going to be, you know, absolutely have absolute research integrity. But where things get in, you know, it's when you get into the, into the weeds, and you're in the lab, and you're starting to do things, that you realize that, um, that this issue of research integrity, um, that there's a lot of gray areas as you're trying to decide how to move forward. And so just letting you think, um, in terms of having research integrity, there are a number of things that one wants to keep in mind. So matters pertaining to data, if you are, you know, if you are operating with research integrity, you really want to make sure that you design your experiments well, that you collect the data properly, that you store the data properly, that you um, follow guidelines with respect to sharing the data, and you, um, when you leave here, you, you have a clear understanding of who owns the data. So uh, how you handle data is an important part of your um, value system in terms of your research integrity. Authorship and publication, peer review, there are research integrity issues here as well. A couple of months ago, I was asked to review a grant proposal from someone um, whose work that is someone in my field whose work that I admire. Um, and this is somebody actually who had scooped me 
on, uh, on a project, but we were still working on the project here. And so I declined to review the grant application because I didn't want to see where he was going with the project once he published the paper. So I said, now I have a conflict of interest because we're working in the same area. I will not review this. I will not review this publication. And in this case, we were working on something that was really close together. Now that doesn't mean I decline all reviewing all papers in my field because I mean otherwise you don't have the experts reviewing the work. So you have to make a judgment call on whether it's appropriate to review a paper, to accept to review a paper or not. And I think with grant applications in particular, one has to be careful because people there are exposing what's going on in the lab and what their ideas are going forward. So those are the kind of decisions that, um, that you need to make. And then we have, want to have integrity in terms of our relationships. I hope that you're in a research laboratory where, you're, uh, where your research mentor is cognizant of the issues of research integrity and that they're setting standards uh, for the laboratory. Um, as, a, as a trainee, it's important that you um, uh, follow the policies of your laboratory that are, you know, in terms of data collection and storage. Um, you want to make sure that you have, um, you keep in mind your research integrity with respect to your peers and your collaborators. And also, going back again to the reputation of the institution, we are all very fortunate to be at one of the finest research institutions in the world. But we, we all have an obligation to, to conduct our research so that it stays one of the most admired institutions within the world. And we have an obligation to the public because the kind of research, the kind of science that we're doing has the potential to, to have an impact on science policy, it also has, uh, the, the taxpayers may be paying for us to do this research, and they have an obligation, or we have an obligation to them to, uh, to be able to say that we are going to do this, uh, that we're doing this, this work as carefully as we can and with as much integrity as we can. So I wanna talk a little bit about data, and I know you're gonna get a, a lot more of this, but um, here's, I've got another one of these questions here that I hope is going to work okay. So, in scientific research, only the information and observations that are made as part of scientific inquiry are considered data. Is that a true or a false statement? Okay, let's take a look at where we are. Ooh, talk about a split decision. Half of you say, or more than a little more than half say it's false, and um, the other 43% say it's true. <laughs> so, does anybody want to uh, give me their? Answer, giving me the rationale for their answer. Let's speak up. I could figure out a rationale for both, but. I actually would be false. Uh huh. Uh, because I feel like in a particular project, so to speak, the, the data you generate is not like the sole data that you're going to talk about in the research branch. So, you also have other publicly available information that's not part of your scientific inquiry, but it's also data that you're using. Okay. So there's other information besides the actual, say, in my case, this would be, you know, number of counts per minute that are being spit out by the simulation counter. That's, that's, that's what I call my data, the numbers that come from the results of the experiment. What about the methodology? 
that part of your data? Is that something that should be recorded properly and archived? What about the instrumentation that you use, the settings on the instrumentation? So um, in general, we consider, even though you know, mentally in our picture, we think about the results of the experiment as being the data, it's very important that you think about the total picture and the, the metadata because having that string of numbers without knowing what, what the uh, protocol was is not really going to help anybody at the end of the day. And if somebody came in and questioned my scientific, you know, somebody, I publish the paper and I show a graph and I show that the numbers are going up and I make an interpretation, they're going to say, well, how did you do the experiment? And so not only do you want to have those numbers written down, but you want to have um, a methodology written down. You want to have the conditions of the experiment. Um, so that, I think that's something that I didn't appreciate so much when I was a student is, you know, is the fact that at some point, you know, asking yourself the question, if somebody challenged my experiment two years from now, would they be able to go back? Would I be able to go back and show them how I did it? Would I have all of that information archived? Um, if uh, some, I, I leave the lab and I leave behind my lab notebooks and um, I was working on a project, but I, I got distracted by another project that was more interesting. If somebody wants to go back and pick up project A, they could go back. Can they go back to my notebook and figure out how to do that? And I can tell you from having been a, a principal investigator for 25 years, there are people's notebooks that I will go back to and they are like beautiful. And you can go back and you know exactly what was done. And there are people who will work for me who I don't even bother going to look because I'm never going to be able to figure it out. So, uh, you know, when you think about the fact that you want your work to be meaningful, and it might be meaningful down the road, having those good, having that good uh, archiving of your data, all of the data is really important. So data are any information or observations that are associated with a particular project, including experimental specimens, technologies, and products related to the inquiry. And the aim of successful data collection should always be to uphold the integrity of the project, the institution, and the researchers involved. So here's my take home message, garbage in, garbage out, right? So in other words, if you do a sloppy job of, of collecting and, and recording your data, the chances of being able to produce, get a high quality product and publication and have it on the other side are going to be much less than if you take the time on the front end of the experiment and develop good systems for, uh, for archiving your data. How am I doing on time here? Five minutes now? Yeah. Okay. So um, th these things are um, not so important. This I just like to show to say that there are challenges associated with uh, storing data because I started my lab 25 years ago. Do you guys even know what those are? <laughs> those are floppy disks. How many, when was the last time you saw a floppy disk, right? Uh, so there's no computer where you can slide the floppy disk anymore that's left in my laboratory. So, um, you know, and, and granted I may be old, but it's not, we're not talking the 1800s here. Okay, we're just talking 20 years ago that these kinds of uh, data disks. So maybe at some point somebody's gonna, you know, 20, 25 years from now, somebody will be making fun of the iPad, who knows? <laughs> okay. Um, so I think uh, given where we are in terms of time, I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to go through these last uh, slides. The one thing that um, I will, so let me just finish up here and just say, I hope that you never run into a problem where you suspect research misconduct. But if you do, I, I, I came up with this, who are you going to call, which was from the first Ghostbusters, was from the the theme song. And the first time I did this lecture, somebody pointed out to me that actually the people who wrote the Ghostbusters theme song were sued for plagiarism. <laughs> <laughs> I was totally un, uh, unaware of that. And so they had some kind of a settlement on that. But if 
um, if you did feel that you were concerned about misconduct, before you call up the journal editor, um, I think it's always good to start locally and maybe talk with people um, locally to just sort of talk through the issue because there's a lot of gray areas in this stuff. And so you can talk to your director of graduate study. You, if, for those of you who have already formed your special committees, there's people on the special committee you could talk to. You can go to a department chair to, uh, to raise the issue. Um, I'm a department chair in molecular medicine and I helped a student resolve something that was published in, in another journal that was actually his work that he had done that he didn't get credit for. Um, there is an Office of Research and Integrity and Assurance on campus, and there are staff members there who could, would be able to advise you. Jan Allen is the Associate Dean for the uh, Academic and Student Affairs in the Grad School. And there's a university ombudsman that you can go to for confidential consultation. So I, I encourage you to use those resources if you need to. And then here's some responsible conduct of research resources, and I, I will give, this, give these to you. So this is, this is one of my favorite definitions of integrity from C.S. Lewis, who was a writer in a, a, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. It's doing the right thing even when no one is watching. So I'll stop and I'll take some, any questions. And I'll turn it over. Yes. I don't know the answer to that. Um, the cross ref, I think, is something that I, I doubt very much. There are plagiarism checkers on the web. I don't know how good they are. So I can't tell you that. Um, I don't have a good yeah, I've been able to use Turnitin as a faculty member, but I, I, I don't know that it's available. Anyone else? Okay, Jeremy, you're up. All right. 